shall overcome. We shall overcome. We shall overcome someday. We shall overcome someday. It was eighteen. 18- 1965 when the Civil War ended, but for many decades after the war, the United States of America still remained divided on many issues. Many of the issues led to the March on Washington in 1963. A landmark event held in front of the Lincoln Memorial, during which Martin Luther King Jr. delivered his historic I Have a Dream speech. The March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. It was a march, as you said, um, to to uh, protest not necessarily the lack of jobs. There were jobs available. It's just that African Americans didn't have access to those jobs. Uh, it, it was very important that the March of Washington was held because it was uh, centered on jobs and freedom. Um, I went to Armstrong on the 12th of June, so the summer quarter was still in session when they held the march on Washington. And because the national media had made such a hype of the possibility of violence, you know, I was advised not to go. I, I really wanted to go because, you know, I had the spirit, and, and you, you, it, sometimes it's hard for young people to, to really capture, you know, how how committed we were and how fearless we were. But anyway, uh, the national media had whipped up this, this possibility of blacks coming to Washington and rioting and all like that. And so uh, since the local uh, NAACP wanted me to remain in school uh, and finish the year and then go on to the University of Georgia, which I did to become the first black undergraduate from Savannah to go to Georgia, they advised me not to go, and I mean, that really hurt my feelings. When I got uh, the notice that the um, March on Washington was being organized, naturally, I had an urgency to be a part of it. So uh, I heard that there was a train, special train coming through South Carolina, I think, I don't. I don't remember exactly where the train started, but it came through South Carolina. And um, I was, I made sure that I was going to be a part of the um, people on that train going to Washington, D.C. in 1963. One major divide in the country following the end of the Civil War was race relations between blacks and whites in the country and overall equality between the two races. I was brought up by parents who believed that everybody was equal. It was never any question that all the Jim Crow laws and all of the other elements comprising um, segregation in our part of the country was wrong. When I was in the 11th grade and I turned 17, I joined the Naval Reserve. So the summer between my 11th and 12th grade years, I went to boot camp at the Naval Training Station in Great Lakes, Illinois. That was my first desegregated experience, if you want to use the word integration, which I rarely use. But that was the first time I interacted with whites on an equal basis, because we didn't interact with whites uh, in a way that you could say you had some genuine interaction. And so, when I came back uh, to school, um, I was already on a course uh, to say that never will I ever allow myself uh, you know, to feel inferior or anything like that because there were some dumb white folk in, in, in my squadron. There were some, some smart folk. There were some dumb black folk, unfortunately, in, in, that, in that company and there were some very smart people. Schools were segregated. 
even though I feel like we really got an excellent education because our teachers had to be creative. Uh, we may not have had a Bunsen burner for every student, but we could work together as a team to learn. We may not have had enough frogs to dissect, but we could get together in a group in our, and we made it fun. So when you look at the teachers and they expose us to other things, literature, Shakespeare, you know, all of those kinds of things that now I don't even know if it's in the public school system. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a lover of poetry. You learned poetry, you could do it. You know, Shakespeare in junior high school, then you get to high school. So we, you know, they were visionaries in their own right. You know, I look at students that have problems with math. When I was in school, I took algebra, trig, geometry, trigonometry, and we were even taught calculus, but even though it was not a part of the curriculum. So those were the advances from the teacher because they went beyond what the, the book said we were supposed to learn. When I was in high school, I didn't know that much about African Americans and the black diaspora because they didn't teach that in the 60s much in Georgia. What they did teach was George Washington crossing the Delaware and the Versailles Treaty and the Boston Tea Party. From the late 1800s into the 1960s, the majority of American states enforced segregation through Jim Crow laws. These laws were enforced even heavier in the South. You can never whip these boys if you don't keep you and them separate. I found that out in Birmingham. You've got to keep the white and the black separate. You know, if you're an African American growing up in the United States, you experience racism. I mean, yeah, I grew up during the Jim Crow era in South Carolina. You know, one of the most racist and discriminatory states in the Union. It's where the Civil War started and everything else. Oh, you got to realize I was born in 1942, and that was during the height of the Jim Crow era. And so everything was segregated in Savannah. I didn't go uh, to an integrated school until I went to the uh, Armstrong State University in 1963. I graduated in 1960. Uh, the Brown decision to desegregate schools came down in 54. So all during that time, uh, the local Board of Education just dragged its feet. And uh, the, under pressure from the federal courts, they had to desegregate the public school system in uh, September of uh, 1963. I went to Armstrong that summer, the schools were desegregated that fall. So that started um, school desegregation uh, in the city of Savannah. Uh, in 1960, when I was still a senior in high school, uh, two of my homeroom classmates were the first arrested in the sit-in movement. So, uh, you know, I, I've got lots of stories to tell about segregation and discrimination in my lifetime. Uh, and we still experience it today. So uh, the struggle continues and that's what we've been uh, talking about as we celebrate the 50th anniversary of the real desegregation of Savannah, which took place in uh, 1963. If you went downtown, you had one white and one colored. The white was cool water, the, the colored was spigot water. The restrooms, you had white females, white males, and colored. One, colored. So that's racism, and we couldn't even buy at one of the lunch counters unless you went downstairs where they only serve colored. You know, and we were called colored, you know, not even Negroes. These practices led to conditions where African Americans were treated inferior and put them at a number of economic, educational, and social disadvantages. While many white Americans found jobs in the defense industry, only a few blacks were hired, and most of them were porters and janitors. After decades of being denied equal or better economic, educational, and social advances, African Americans were ready for change. We have made progress with reducing overt acts of racism. 
like the shootings and the bombings and uh, the lynchings, you know, don't occur uh, as often as they were occurring. They still happen from time to time. The Trayvon Martin situation is a clear example uh, of a justice system that doesn't issue out justice. Other people are not going to empower you. You must empower yourselves. We have to tell our story and tell our history no matter where we are. If it's in the church, if it's at a family reunion, if it's in our homes, if it's in the neighborhood, if it's at a community meeting, we need to go and tell some aspect of our history and tell our story. What is going on today because our youth, and it's not, I can say this, not just our youth, but even with the older folks, they don't have a clear understanding of our history because we're letting other people tell us who we are and guess what we do? We embrace it. And on top of we digest it and we then, you know, and we then regurgitate it when it's absolutely incorrect. And I don't blame the youth. I blame us because we have not told the story. You know, young people and adults are mesmerized or they are in awe when we talk about what happened in the movement. There is one thing that I admire about the Jewish community. They tell their history to their children at a very early age because they never want to see the Holocaust, Holocaust happen again. African American communities when I grew up were a little different than African American communities now. Uh, people knew each other, people looked out for each other. Um, and even though I grew up in a really, really rough neighborhood, everybody looked out for everybody else. But if I could get the young people to utilize all of the resources that are available to, to them today, there's no end to, to the accomplishments that we can face as a race of people. Civil rights demonstrations were happening all across the South. African Americans were heavily involved in peaceful protests and sit-ins to break down racial barriers and to gain better jobs. From the very beginning of the United States, we were discriminated against because African Americans were counted as three-fifths of a person in the Constitution that created the nation. So from the very beginning, we were not treated equal, but we were a part of what became the United States. As a Jew, I sort of have faced in my lifetime some of the same experiences. When I was just a kid and went to grammar school, I had to defend myself because I was Jewish. So that helped to give me insight into how black people felt about being discriminated against. We had a mass meeting every Sunday at different churches and um, we, uh, you know, it was normal, peaceful, sang songs and old spirituals and it would tell you what to do and everything went along fine. King had said that I, dream, that I have a dream speech prior in Savannah, Georgia, at least the latter part of it, at Second African Baptist Church. But then also knowing that in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, having people up that side, that he said it there, and then having my folks' connection tied to Detroit, and King having said it there, and then understanding like, wow. 50 years after the historic march, there is still much work to be done in a new generation of America. Dr. King, that some people don't realize, he understood. Yeah, one, you got the march on Washington, but he also said we got to have a poor people march too. Well, he understood that there had to be an economic change here, and that's when folks now who had supported King during the march on Washington now turn, they basically turn on King because they say, wait a minute, what are you doing, Mark? Because mm -hmm. he started saying, hey, everyone needs to have a guaranteed income here in the United States. Mm -hmm. That's the King that I love, that I tell people. That's the one that I love. You can talk about I have a dream all you want. But I'm telling the king that go and say, hey, we gotta bring our economic parity. Because he understood that. And the March of Washington was a step to getting him to that point. Mm -hmm. 
that's the king that I marvel at. That's the king who, you know, I tell people, that's the one I want people to remember, talk about. Well, as we celebrate this 50th anniversary, we were talking just on yesterday. It's almost like deja vu all over again. Look what is happening as far as the Voting Rights Act. Look, we have people, you know, we fought then for jobs. We're still talking about jobs. We're talking about economic conditions. You know, they said all things change, but all th some things remain the same. If you would note closely, they have the Stars and Stripes because it is the land of the free, United States of America. And then Martin Luther King sits in center because they have this praying hands. You can get a good shot of the praying hands. If you see them, you will notice that if you put the hands together, they connect and pray. But we pray for what? Freedom. And Dr. Martin Luther King, being a reverend, he taught spirituality, and he taught us to love one another as Jesus Christ taught. So the chains are broken if you pray and you have unity and work together for a common goal. So the, the, the fight goes on. It may not be the marches that we did in those days, but we must continue the struggle, and the journey will never end. In, uh, in the day, white folk would just stand up and tell you, I don't like niggas. I mean, I know y'all don't like that word, but that's a, a, a word that means something to me because I was called that a lot. But they were just upfront with it. Now, they act the same way, but they don't use that vicious rhetoric anymore. But their actions have now been codified into practices and policies that work against us, just like they were overtly working against us. Now it's more undercover, it's smooth. I like to describe it as like going down to the Savannah River when a calm day, when, when you see a calm Savannah River, but underneath that calmness is a very swift current. And so the racism of the 21st century is like that river. It is calm on the top, but underneath, uh, it is swift and strong. And every now and then, you see something that brings that swift current to the surface. And there are events that, 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 that make that current surface. Our first president, Major Richard R. Wright, uh, he attended Atlanta University. Now, he was a boy, and General O.O. Howard, he was in charge of the Freedmen's Bureau, and he came down here and he asked Major Wright, well, look, you know, Richard, when he was a little boy, he was like, what should we tell, you know, the people of the North about the Africans in the South? And Major Richard R. Wright said, tell them we are rising. Tell them we are rising. One day, this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creeds. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners, Will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood? I have a dream. My four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their